Greetings. Today we're going to discuss ionic bonding, one of the three types of bondings that we have already discussed in a previous video. So what is ionic bonding? We already mentioned that ionic bonding is between a metal and a nonmetal. The left-hand side of the periodic table and the right-hand side of the periodic table above, above the zigzag line. So it involves a transfer of electrons. So one atom gives up its electron, the other atom steals that electron, takes it from it. And here's an example of a Bohr model of sodium chloride. Here's sodium. Sodium has 11 positive charges and 11 negative charges. So therefore, we have 2 plus 8 plus one more electron in the outermost energy level that makes this atom very unstable, very unhappy. It does not like that at all. Chlorine, on the other hand, has two, eight, and seven electrons. That one is transferred over from the sodium ion. Then what happens at this point? These two become the sodium ion, positive ion, which is a cation, and this becomes the negative ion, which is the anion, the chloride ion. Because this becomes negatively charged, because it has one additional electron, and sodium becomes positively charged because it has one more proton than electrons. Initially, it had 11 and 11, 11 protons, 11 electrons, but now it has lost one electron, now it has 11 protons and 10 electrons. Now, just to refresh your memory, or if you're learning it for the first time, a cation may help you to remember that there's a plus sign in the middle, becomes, it's a positive charge. Anions do not have a plus in the middle, so they're negatively charged. You could also remember it as anions. The negative ion steals, and that's a negative thing. Stealing is negative, right? We all know that. So that is the anion, the negative. So these ionic compounds are all salts, crystals. This is what we call the crystal lattice. A crystal lattice is a repetitive arrangement of atoms in an ionic compound. In this case, we have sodium ions, the purple ones, and then we have green ones, the chloride ions. Sodium and chlorine bonded together form this lattice that stacks one on top of the other and they alternate so that because positive and negative attract each other, they interact with each other by this force of attraction and form this beautiful crystal. Here on this side, I have what it actually looks like, what sodium chloride looks like under a microscope. It looks like it forms, it actually forms cubes. And every Every type of ionic compound forms a different shape of crystal, simply because of how those atoms are arranged in this crystal lattice. All right, so first of all, quick reminder, salts are all ionic compounds. We call them salts. Now, the previous one, we were talking about sodium chloride, that's table salt, that's a specific salt, and we're just used to calling it salt. However, all ionic compounds are salts, and they are all solids at room temperature. A lot of them are white, but many of them have certain colors. And now, to show you what I mean and some of these properties, I'd like you to watch this video clip. So I'm looking at some ionic salts here, and as you can tell, uh, they're varying colors. Uh, we have three of them here. I have a blue one. This is copper sulfate uh, pentahydrate. This is 
sodium chloride and this one over here is potassium iodide. If you come really close you can take a look at the sodium chloride but it's very hard to see the sodium and chloride ions are stacked in, in a cube form. This one has a different kind of crystal and it is a very pretty blue crystal and it um, its shape is different because we have a polyatomic ion involved here. Now there are some properties that you know about and these properties are very simple to remember. One of them is conductivity. So if I place these crystals here you notice that they're non-conductors. If I place a few crystals of salt, let me dump this out. All right, I'm going to place a few crystals of salt in here to see if they will conduct electricity, and apparently not. They do not conduct electricity as solids. But I'm going to go ahead and dump it in some distilled water, and I'm going to stir. And I can either use this um, handy dandy apparatus to check its conductivity. And uh, if you notice, the light uh, goes on, the, the red light, and uh, is also some of the green light. Uh, but we can use a uh, larger apparatus and notice that there's a lot of conductivity here. So ionic compounds will conduct electricity when dissolved in water. I could do the same with copper uh, sulfate, or, uh, but I want to show you that water, plain water, which is not an ionic compound, uh, will not conduct electricity at all. Let's add a few crystals of the potassium iodide to this beaker and we will stir and let's see then see what kind of conductivity we get again very bright very conductive and we know that when dissolved in water ionic compounds will conduct electricity so it's a good idea not to be swimming in a pool when you have an electric storm going on because there are a lot of ions that are dissolved in that particular pool. As well as in the ocean, there are a lot of salts that are dissolved in, in the ocean. And it's not just a sodium chloride, table salt. There are many other salts that are dissolved in there. So they are good conductors of electricity in the water. We've already looked at some of the properties, and now I have outlined them here. I have listed them, and the reasons for these properties. These salts, ionic salts, have a very high melting point. It's very hard to melt them. So the reason for that is that they have very strong bonds. These positive and negative ions have a great force of attraction because of their opposite charges. So they're, they're very hard to separate. So they have a very high melting point because of those very, very strong bonds between those ions. They are non-conductors as solids. As you already have seen, they do not conduct electricity as solids. However, if we place them in water and stir the water, these salts will conduct electricity. Why don't they conduct electricity as a solid? Because you have no flowing ions. Solids of room temperature, again, very strong bonds. The same thing goes for high melting point. They're good conductors when dissolved in water. We've mentioned this in any liquid, but mainly in water. And they're brittle and very hard. And again, because of those strong bonds. What I'd like to do is to show you how to draw these compounds that are ionic. First, I'm going to draw the orbital notation for potassium chloride. So I have KCl, and I'm going to first of all write K. I'm going to write 
the abbreviated orbital notation. So for k, it's going to be, I'm going to write the abbreviated or orbital notation using argon core AR 4s, and there's going to be only one electron there. So argon core 4s1. Now, I'm going to go ahead and write the CL. I'm going to, again, write the abbreviated one. CL has EM core. And then, once we're at neon, we go, please pull out your periodic tables so that you can follow me along on this. Then we have neon core. Then we go down to the third energy level, 3s2, 3p5. So... 3s, 2, and 3p, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. All right, and the reason why I'm doing this is to illustrate how this happens. Well, look at here. We have one orbital that is missing a pair. And we have one orbital with a missing pair. So potassium, being the metal, it's going to lose that. And it's going to be placed here. So remember that the aim of all these ions is really to, to achieve potassium. We'll have the configuration of argon, which is the aim that achieves stability. And chlorine will also have the configuration of argon. Now, we can do the same thing by using the Lewis dot symbols. I'm going to place the K here, and the valence electrons is only one. Then, I'm going to say Cl has seven valence electrons, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And I can draw the electron going to the Cl. Now, this becomes plus one in charge. This becomes negative one in charge. Now, I have iron and oxygen. I'm not going to tell you how I get the valence electrons of iron, but just accept it for now because the transition metal. But we're going to go ahead and do Fe, and I'm going to tell you that this has three valence electrons. And then oxygen has six valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six. And it has two places for two electrons. Well, as a matter of fact, we can have this electron move in here, and this electron move in here, and that satisfies the octet rule for oxygen, but certainly not for iron. It still has one electron left. So what do we do next? Well, how about having a second oxygen? So I'm going to do that and say one, two, three, four, five, six. And this electron can go in here. Perfect. However, we have a problem. We need one more. We have one more electron. We need one more electron is needed here. So therefore, I'm going to have to have another iron. So I'm going to go ahead and place a, another iron here. Iron has one, two, and three. And now I'm going to go ahead and place this electron over here. That satisfies this oxygen, this oxygen, Fe, because remember zero is equal to eight in this particular case. But I still have two extra electrons here. What do we do now? Well, what about one more oxygen? So I'm going to place my oxygen here. One, two, three, four. Five, six. Now, these two electrons, one can go right here, and the other one can go right in here. Is everybody satisfied? Yes, 
zero is equal to uh, eight. In this particular case, we have two iron atoms, two, three oxygen atoms, and we would write Fe2 O two, three, three, which amounts to the same thing you did back in the day when you wrote Fe plus two and O, sorry, sorry, Fe plus three and O negative two and you crisscrossed and this became a three and that became a two. Same idea, just now you know where this came from and why it happens. All right, well, have a phenomenal day.